Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture, the magazine of American beekeeping. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flotta, the editor of Bee Culture magazine. We're here today with Dr. Jim Tu, retired extension specialist from the Ohio State University. I'm really looking forward to this interview. I met uh, Dr. Tu, met him back at the end of the 80s when I took a 3D beekeeping course from him there at the Extension in Wooster, and I think it was one of the best training sessions I've ever taken. And he's been writing for my magazine longer than I have, so he's got even more history with bee culture than I do. It'll be fun to talk to him. Well, that's great. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, and let's, uh, let's call him up right now. Well, we're here now with Dr. James Tu. Uh, Jim has been uh, gracious to join us this afternoon at uh, Beekeeping Today podcast. Welcome, Jim. Thanks a lot. I'm really happy to be here. This is kind of a new format for me, so I'm enjoying doing it. Well, we're having a great time with the podcast, and uh, and it's it's going over pretty well, too. It's good to see you again, Jim. Uh, We've been doing our webinars for a while, and of course, you've been writing for us forever. Uh, so I look forward to chatting a little bit more today. Well, you know, it is kind of odd, Kim, for as much as we talk to each other, that we don't talk like this about beekeeping. We talk about plans and whatever. So I'm keen to go here. I'm keen to go. And yeah, we get to talk to other people, but not to each other. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All we need now is a couple cigars and beers, and we could just have a regular beekeeping meeting or something. That I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm good for it. Well, Jim, well, well, Jim, go ahead, Kim. Jim, one of the things we wanted to do today, just to give people who haven't been around as long as you and I have been, is to uh, just give us a brief, if you, if you would, give us a brief background history of, of uh, your time at Ohio State University and, and some of the adventures that you got into there. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to do some reminiscing. I... Uh, I need to tell you, I really didn't mean to get into beekeeping. It just kind of happened. I was keen to become an entomologist. And I didn't really know which aspect of entomology all those years ago, pesticides where the money was. So I fiddled around with that for a while, and I almost by accident took a bee class. (laughs) And then that fired me off to this day. Wow. I thought so. I I'd always thought that you you had a family background in beekeeping, but that's that's not the case. Huh? No, no, I, I really didn't. I, I really didn't. I wish I could boldly say, "Yeah, my great grandfather." <laughs> but, but my family family background in beekeeping was tormenting all stinging insects with a BB gun or a stone, and then running because it was all very exciting. <laughs> So I kept going to school, and I kept going to school, and I was crazy for bees, and I really didn't mean to be an academician of any kind. I I really meant to be a beekeeper, you know? I really meant to just know all I could about bees, and then one day you wake up, and you realize that your wife's paid for this, and (laughs) she's been very patient, and your dad's told you, Jim, you can't make a living with your hobby. And so you think, wow, you got to do something with life. So I (laughs) was lucky enough to get a job at Ohio State. At first, I, uh, I taught commercial beekeeping in a program that's not taught there anymore. That was during the days when uh, killer bees were running up, just running crazy and uh, varroa mites were killing everything. Yeah. So that program struggled at that time. Is that still, they, was they, that still from Wooster? Everything from yeah. Wooster or were you down in Columbus? No, I've never been in Columbus. I was mm-hmm. always in Worcester. They have a, a large agricultural campus here in Worcester, Ohio, right. Ohio State does. So a lot of agriculture is about 100 miles away from the Columbus campus mm-hmm. here in Worcester, quiet place. I never meant to stay at Ohio State. I mean, they, they know that. I thought I'd come here and work three years or so and maybe go back someplace where my accent would fit better. <laughs> but, you know, things come and go and financial exigencies arise and recessions and then you're lucky to have a job at all and then by the time everything's good you got kids in school and your wife's got a job teaching in high school and it's going to cost too much to move so i had a great time i uh, 
I worked at Ohio State 36 years. I, I worked with the Africanized Bee Program from Ohio State out of Washington, D.C., so we roamed all over and got involved in that. I was, uh, since bees are always eccentric, I was, got a grant to do a satellite series. I, we thought then that satellites were going to be the way of the world. Yeah. And the 90s, it just, actually, 96 doesn't seem like a long time ago to me, but <laughs> I know some of the listeners weren't even born in 96. So we did, we uh, bounced things off satellite dishes and we traveled all over. It was a young man's project. We'd do this thing on Wednesday night. And then by the next afternoon at three, we would be over in Bellsville, Maryland, two or three hundred miles away, interviewing people there for the next Wednesday night. Mm. One of the last things, though, that I that I used some of that video experience, we a good friend of mine, uh, John Grafton, and I got some money to do a video series for the Ohio State Beekeeper. We, you want to go onto the OSBA website and have a look at that. There's a lot of beginning segments there that range anywhere from three or four minutes to 10 minutes. So have a look at all the beginner stuff. I retired from Ohio State after uh, 36 years, but I didn't retire from beekeeping. So I still serve as a contract professor for Auburn University, and I teach a class at the University of Maryland. That's great. So I'm still involved. Well, I was looking at Amazon, and you have a couple books out there too. They're still available, actually. The, the Beekeeping Problem Solver... Uh, Beekeepers Problem Solver, 100 Common Problems Explored and Explained. Now, if any listeners want that, there's only eight left in stock, so you want to order soon. Another book is, is Wisdom for Beekeepers, 500 Tips for Successful Beekeeping. And there's only one left of that that, wow. that, that edition. So uh, that's great. Do you have a couple of books out there? Yeah, I need to thank him for that. He gave me a, a door opening to that. I, I probably never would have been able to do that, but he had an end, and I he offered it to me, and I took it. So thank you, Kim. <laughs> More than happy to help, Jim. That's great. Anytime. <laughs> I know I was. Uh, I started. I took. I think I took my first beekeeping class from you down in Worcester. It had to have been before my daughter was born, so I was eighty six or eighty seven. It was a three day course, two day course, weekend course. Yep, we tried all formats. You're right, and yeah. I, I came here. I came to Worcester in '78, so '87 was almost ten years by then. We we did queen production, honeybee classes, queen production, and management programs. And for a while, we took we took international tours and went to China and Australia and New Zealand and roamed the world. I, right. I had a nice time. I have no complaints at all. I mean, even though I didn't intend to spend my life here. It worked out well. I could have I could have found worse places to spend my life, I guess. <laughs> That's good. That's real good. You and I got involved in doing some video work down the road. Uh, you and I and Bob Smith, if you remember that. We oh, did oh, some yeah. series. I do remember that. Yeah. He was a good friend of mine and yours, and we shot video. He was actually on that China trip and shot a lot of video there. So a lot's come and gone. I, I, uh, I need to tell Auburn University. I appreciate them. I've worked for them 25 years, and I don't want to leave them out talking about Ohio State so much. They've been really good to me, and the beekeepers of Alabama have been very supportive. So here I am. Tell us what you do in Auburn, Jim. I, I, uh, the primary thing that I've been have built there is a, is a rather – it's not large by today's standards, but it's certainly a large bee meeting in Alabama. Every February for the last – oh. I think 24, 25 years or so, we've had a workshop there. And we've grown to about six to 700 participants. It'll be February the 1st in the middle of the state, Clanton, Alabama. And we Sounds like a good meeting. That. And, uh, you know, I mentioned this iBook, or maybe I didn't mention it. There's a, if you look on the web under Backyard Beekeeping and use my name, there's a book there. It's free, 36 pages long for beginner beekeepers. It's not in print anymore, and it's being converted to an iBook. And it'll be out within nine months, maybe a year, so be patient. But you'll be able to take that off the web, read the book. It'll be a free resource if you want to get involved in that. You're still a beekeeper, and, and you know, all the things that you've done that you just talked about certainly has an influence on that. But like everybody else, you get in a bee yard, and you're on your own. And, and uh, I know that 
you and I have looked at installing packages and we're going to come back and examine those packages a little bit later on the Jim and Kim show, but share some of the things that have gone wrong and spectacularly right in B yards with you over the years, because somebody with that many years of experience can certainly share a lot of wisdom. So people just getting started things to do things not to do. I guess that the, the, we mellow a little bit when we look back on some of these things, but some of them are still incredibly interesting. Um, what do you got on some of those? Well, I was, I was thinking when you gave me all this credit for all this wisdom and all this list, <laughs> I, I can give you a long list of mistakes and things I wouldn't recommend doing. Um, I would never recommend stepping on your own queen. I have done that. Uh, I knew I did that because I could see the red dot that was on her thorax <laughs> stuck in the sole of my shoe. I'm not laughing at I, you, Jim. I'm laughing with you. I understand. <laughs> and I, you know, you do have things that happen. This beekeeping thing is, is an eccentric business, which you just look at it objectively. Most people run and scream and try to get away from bees, except those of us who want to know more about what's going on. So in that bee yard back there, I do. I, I still work a lot. I, it's right out here behind me. i got a fence up so my neighbors don't know everything that I'm doing back there. <laughs> and I spend some quality time back there. The older I've gotten, I've kind of moved away from honey production because that stuff's heavy. As my eyes have become to give me more and more of a challenge, I don't raise as many queens as I used to. But I keep bees. I make some honey. I uh, pick up some swarms. And I'm still fulfilled by that. But this technology we're doing right now and video pieces that could go along with it, I really enjoy doing that. It freshens all aspects of beekeeping. I mean, how many packages do you need to put in before you've been there, done that? But if you add a camera to it or a microphone to it, then all of a sudden that particular package day is different. So those things back there in the bee yard, they bounce around all of this. You know, you talk about queens and all that goes wrong with them, and you can talk about the thing that makes beekeeping beekeeping, and that stings. They can always light you up. They can, they can just destroy all of your humility. You can stand in a public place and beat yourself severely about the head and neck the whole time saying, I'm an accomplished beekeeper. I know what I'm doing. Uh, nothing, nothing makes you young again like a bee inside your veil. <laughs> I, uh, I was giving a, recording a small piece with the video, and, a, and one lone bee came over and began to buzz around my nose and my mouth, and I captured me unintentionally swatting and swinging and trying to knock that bee, not swallow her. And when I looked at it, I thought, what a dummy you are you look terrible and i erased that video and i guess now i'm sorry that i did <laughs> the uh, the thing kim's talking about one of those things a hundred years ago a young woman on friday afternoon late with a small kid came <laughs> over and to the bee lab and yeah i was leaving i walked out the door and ran into it she said but i show her daughter the bees her daughter was three i didn't want to i tried to put her off but there's no putting her off I had a four-frame nuke right beside the University of Maryland apiary steps there. And so against all my better judgment, I took my veil and put on the little girl. And I could tie the, the strings around her ankle, ankles. <laughs> I admonished the mom to back up. Using no smoke and no veil, just a hive tool, I opened <laughs> that four-frame nuke. And I got through it. I showed drones. I showed bees. I don't think I found the queen. But just as I was closing down, Jeff, it's always the one you're not expecting. It's the one that had the idea. This guy's a real dumb butt. I've had it with him. That bee took off. I didn't see her leave, but I did know when she flew right up my right nostril. Well, of course, you know what happened at that point. I did not know that when you're stung in your right nostril, your, your knees give out. <laughs> And then when your knees give out, you're at eye level with that little girl, and her eyes were as big as the bottom of coffee cups. And off to one side, the mom was shouting at both of us, is everything all right? Is everything okay? I was crying profusely. And then before that little girl, I pulled the biggest thing out of my nose that she had ever seen come out of an adult man's nose. So I rushed through this. 
because as I'm telling it, my eyes begin to water again. It had happened 30 <laughs> years ago. And I can tell you for a fact that that little girl who's now a full-grown woman and probably has kids of her own, and the woman has grandkids by now, and I can tell you they're not keeping bees. They are not keeping bees for the spectacle that I put on. Oh, I'm God. rattling around in that because I still do deeply enjoy beekeeping. I shop around. You know, you write a book or you make a picture or you do a video or you make a split or you put in one of these hive monitoring gadgets yeah. or you go give a talk. There's always so much you can do in beekeeping. And Kim said, what do you do in that backyard? I just do whatever comes to mind. But I will tell you this. I don't cut much grass. <laughs> I don't paint much equipment. Uh, don't have the energy for it. The bees don't seem to mind. So I keep things looking unkept, if that makes sense. I don't have a nicely mowed bee yard. I let the bees be bees, and I let me be an old man back there. <laughs> you know, I think uh, I've, I, I think it, for here on out, I'll never open up a veil with with any spectators. I th Smart move, Jeff. Yeah, Smart yeah. move. It's uh, <laughs> it's always inviting trouble. Uh, you can do it a hundred times and not have a problem. And this, the minute there's a camera on or or a witness, things go wrong. Uh, Jim, you know one of the other, one of the other things that uh, you've been involved in. I know over the years, what, kind of back when, and this is I'm uh, like I say reminiscing, but it does have some lessons learned here. Is moving bees at night, and and I know that. You've been through some adventures there, but uh, <clears throat> it's coming up pollination season, or already is for a lot of people. And if you were going to give some some uh, oversight, some uh, advice on uh, what do you got, what do you got that that uh, that uh, might help somebody who's thinking of doing that? I, I I do have some comments on that. You cannot be too prepared. You need you need multiple strikers for to lighting smokers. You need multiple smokers because you're going to lay one down in the dark and then you're going to have to go back and find your flashlight. And if you drop the flashlight, uh, you need a second flashlight maybe to find that one. So you probably almost need to go in with almost double everything. And then strange things go wrong. One night that I was working bees and moving bees and the dew fell and the truck and the trailer were going slightly uphill and then the truck wouldn't move because the grass had become mm -hmm wet. So when you pull into the yard, even think about how you're going to get that trailer if you're pulling one or how the truck's going to angle out when you're in that situation. And we're doing this in Alabama sometimes. Be aware that you're not the only thing out there. There's, you know, venomous snakes in the area and, and black widow spiders. So it's okay if you're a little bit jumpy and put that flashlight on everything. And of course, you want it to have fresh batteries, and keep going. I'll finish on this note. I have run over smokers <laughs> in the dark. You can't see them, and you're trying to get out of there because the bees are loaded and daylight's coming. So you need to go in as prepared as you can possibly be. And no, propolis will not hold hives together during a bee move. Don't ever fall for that. <laughs> Strap them, staple them, nail them, or something but never say it's a quick move. The propolis will hold it together. I haven't opened this hive in three months. The propolis won't hold it together. It's going to be miserable. Good, good advice. I know uh, everybody who has moved bees at least once has learned most of those lessons. And if you and if hopefully you've uh, learned them well enough so that you move them again. One of the other things is um, just just the, the the world of beekeeping that has evolved since you started. And, and when you look at it today, the honey market and, and the pollination business and the rules and regulations, um, take a half a step back and kind of give, can you give me an overview of from where you came, what's what we're looking at today and what you see maybe down the road? In my, in my earliest years, and I'm not like a hundred years old, but this has happened fairly quickly and true in real time. When I started, honey was king or queen or premier or whatever. And it was intriguing to watch it flip 
to watch the entire industry flip and pollination become king, queen, or premier, or whatever. And that that's happened. You know, if you're not in the pollination business as a, either a sideliner or commercial beekeeper, you're you're probably doing something else that's creative, but the money right now is in pollination. That was intriguing to live through, to that, that big change where pollination drives the bee industry. Now, we still make honey, and honey is still in good demand. We import a lot. We can't meet our own requirements. And as the bee populations have declined, and as we've gotten better at destroying what's lovingly known as weeds, nectar sources and pollen sources, and uh, honey supplies have declined too. So if you can make local honey with a local label, it, it usually sells very well. There's still a good, strong demand for honey. So that, that's been enjoyable. But the thing I really want to discuss is not just the honey pollination flip, but it's been the incredible number of new people and new organizations that have come into beekeeping. Yeah. I mean, I, I used to know in the early days, I, I basically knew everybody in the room. And I don't know anybody now. I mean, you go in and you're this old guy. What's he here for? Uh, is, he the, is he the industry historian or what? So that has been really intriguing. And I'm glad that I had the, the, enough life synergy to participate in this and see this change that was coming. It was really dark, Kim. You don't need me telling you, but it was dark during the killer bee years and the introduction and establishment of Varroa mites. I mean, it, it was seriously dark when commercial guys were losing their operations to Varroa and the public was terrified of Africanized bees. And to see all that change now and all the new groups and the new agencies and the commitment to beekeeping, we will never go back. To where we were. And one of the things I know just has to happen, I mean, even in my yard, I've got some of those scale devices and what's that device called, Kim, that uh, Wi-Fi sends you information? That the Hive Tracks? Hive Tracks. Not, yeah, Hive Tracks and the actual device. The brood, yeah, Broodminder and Arnia. Broodminder. Yeah, yeah, yeah Broodminder. I, I really believe that we're living in the twilight of just a common wood box beehive. <laughs> I just can't help but believe that in the next five to 10 years, that wood box, that rigid polyester styrofoam box is going to be just as electronified as you can hope to imagine with your tracking devices in the hives and monitors and readouts. And I hope I can stay active long enough to see pheromone sensing oh that'd be so you put an app on your phone or something and you walk up and you just take a sniff <laughs> and you can tell varroa populations are the are the issue of the day so beekeeping is is really evolved nicely to stay current i mean i always compare bluebirds i try to keep bluebirds what a pain that is i basically end up just having bluebirds murdered by house sparrows. But if you compare how beekeeping has evolved and has grown and kept current, even in the face of all these issues, when other environmental issues have just taken a beating, something as common as lightning bugs. So it's been good to see beekeeping thrive the way it has after we went through such a low period. Yeah, it was. Uh, and, and with the magazine, I remember going through all of that, uh, trying to keep an upbeat tone and keep people interested and keep people informed. Uh, you were certainly instrumental in that. Uh, a lot of what you did was instrumental in giving people good information. Uh, it's interesting you bring this up because I kind of look at now, looking back, you were the technology, you and the people that were writing for us were the technology of the day. We were the information deliverer. You were the source of the information and 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 keeping people up to speed as much as possible so uh we, we've done this we've done this a couple of times now and 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 not different ways you know we got people who are generating information people who are transferring it and, and always people who can use it so it's uh it's been a fun ride so well, it's far. also interesting to contrast it with on one end of the 
spectrum you have, the new technology, the the hive minders, the hive tracks, the arneas, the satellite sensing, the pallet trackers, all of that. And then the other side, you have people experimenting, or I shouldn't say experimenting, but using top bar hives and going to the, yeah. the that end of the technology spectrum, if you will. And uh, so it's, it's really fun. It's it kind of, it's inclusive of everyone. It's not everyone's in the 10 frame box anymore. So it's You know, fun. just to say you're a beekeeper is like saying I'm an automobile. There's so <laughs> many different kinds of, and models of cars that are all automobiles. And there's so many different kinds of people who are beekeepers. There was a woman, I yeah. went up, uh, since I don't have much to lose anymore, we, my wife and I just went zip lining out in Yellowstone. <laughs> and, of course, you're tied in five ways from breakfast. You can't, all you can do is have a heart attack, but nothing else is going to go wrong, I hope. And the woman who was lacing me up and taking care of me was a young woman, perfectly physically fit. And on the inside of her right arm, she had a, a honeybee tattooed. Well, I was nice. all over that. Are you a beekeeper? She said, uh, no, no, I'm really not. She said, I just really like bees and their lifestyle and what they do for the environment. They're such a pivotal species. I respect them a lot. And I said, well, do you ever plan on having bee colonies? She said, well, I, you know, sometime I might, but not right now. So that woman is one of these people. She likes bees, but she doesn't have any beehives. Yeah. She went as far as to get a a tattoo or ink or whatever you call it today, a tattoo in my day, I don't know what it is now, and, and carry around a lifelong mark on her arm, but yet not really keep bees. So it's really hard to define what a beekeeper is today. Top bar hive, electronic person, high school teacher, commercial mm -hmm. beekeeper. Yep. It's all over the page on, on how many ways you can enjoy and be involved in the bee world and meet your personal needs that's really good it's good for good for all of us good for the environment good for uh, all beekeepers the more more awareness we have and no longer the uh, uh, it's not always it's n beekeepers are no longer the laugh track in a comedy uh, or the, the right. beekeeper with the veil now it's more uh, tied to the environment and awareness and uh, uh, sustainability so that's good I don't yes. plant I don't I don't kill I don't use a lot of herbicides on my lawn, so I have clover. And, of course, my neighbors have beautiful lawns, and there's me in the mm -hmm. middle of all of this. So one neighbor inquisitively said, you, you must be growing all this clover for your bees. And my <laughs> wife said, no, he's just not putting out herbicide. The uh, clover comes in naturally. But the neighbor thought that I was planting clover in my lawn to feed my bees. Of course, the clover in my acre lawn would make about third of a teaspoon maybe of honey yeah. but other people have a perception now of what beekeepers are doing and why they're yeah. doing it that's been rewarding it's been good to see that evolution we uh <clears throat> in some of our earlier podcasts during pollinator week jim we were talking to uh some of the people who are involved in providing more forage for bees uh and everybody and their brother's first piece of information is let your lawn go, grow some flowers for bees, uh, feed a bee, grow a flower sort of thing. So, yeah. Uh, uh, and that brings me up to something you've been writing about recently. How's your pollinator garden doing? Well, it's going to do real well once I uh, get it tilled up. I got the grass killed. <laughs> uh, I'm, prob I'm working on a really nice pollinator garden for next year. That's how it's okay. working out. For, well, I, 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 do, I, I, got the, I have the seed bought. I paid a lot of money for seed. And I did plant some, but what I, what I had in mind was just to kill part of my grass. I think you said till it twice and spray it twice, and then just jump in the deep end of the pool. I've done this once before, but I don't know what to do with a pollinator garden when it's not in bloom, when it's getting kind of scruffy. Do you mow it down and replant it, or does it reseed itself, or do you leave it with an unkept look? You know, I, I, I hope all these questions are answered, and I hope that having such gardens becomes more and more routine as the next year or so passes, instead of uh, people like me not really knowing 
how to keep it looking fresh so that the neighbors don't think you've just totally lost your mind. Well, one, now, one, of the th one of the things, I'm going to interrupt you here. One of the things is that scrubby period when it's done blooming is when they're making the seeds for next year. So uh, don't get too carried away there, neighbors notwithstanding. So, uh, and Jeff, I'm going to, inter I'm going to uh, interlude here. Yep. Uh, coming up on July 21st, 2018, uh, Bee Culture Magazine Pollinator Day at the Root Company. It's in Medina, Ohio. You can see uh, announcements for it on our webpage and in our magazine. Uh, we've got a, we're going to have eleven gardens out there this year. We've got seed companies we're testing. We've got the pollinator uh, partnership people. We've got uh, master gardeners. We've got uh, feed to bee gardens. We've got a lot to look at. We'll have soil and water there. We'll have a lot of people who are talking about what they're growing and what they're doing. Jim, you're invited to come down and look with us. Yeah, Denise. I was thinking that. What's that date again, Kim? July 21st. It's running from 10 to 3, and and uh, it's free. There's free parking. You come in, stroll around, look at the flowers, talk to the people, take home some information, and call it a day. But uh, uh, July 21st, come on down. Well, I should do that. That's that's Amber Barnes, who's on uh, one of our earlier podcasts. Uh, the Pollinator uh, Partnership will be there as well. Yep. She can answer your uh, the garden question. There you go. She's got three of them up there. We well, say what I want to do is I want to grow flowers, but I don't really want to be a gardener. <laughs> so there's kind of a difference. I can't take on a full blown, flat out garden project and then keep bees and keep six grandkids too. Actually, you can. The nice thing about pollinator gardens we found is that they're pretty self maintaining. Uh, once you get the bed prepared and you get them planted. Um, kind of step back and get out of the way and let the let the insects that are going to visit do their thing during the summer yeah. and then c come fall you mow it down and uh, leave all of the leave all of the mowings sitting right on the pollinator garden so any seeds in there are able to uh, take root and get out of the way next spring well I, that sounds easy enough to do of course i and everybody else on this planet has a mower <laughs> so i've already got that i'm good to go <laughs> there you go all right, Jim. This has been this has been great. Yeah, it's um, been wonderful. Uh, got to, got to got to talk a little bit about where you've been and where you've come from and what you were doing and where you're headed. Um, any any final words? No, I want to I want to just hammer one more thought that we're in a good time. We're in a good place right now. And any beekeeper who listens to this or any beekeeper who gets wind of this conversation. We're in a real good place right now. So it's a good time to be in bees. It's really enjoyable, and remarkably rewarding. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Jim, for uh, joining us today and, and look forward to having you back in the future. Thank you so much for having me at all. Thank you. You bet. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Bye-bye. See you, Kel. Bye. I was really happy that we were able to get Jim on the phone today to talk about, uh, well, his experiences in beekeeping and, and teaching, and it's always he's always a good storyteller. Yeah, he is. Uh, and, you know, if you like listening to Jim, too, yeah. what you need to do is listen to the Kim and Jim Show uh, webinars that we have sponsored by Bee Culture Magazine. We've got two coming up in July. We've got one on, I'm looking at the calendar here, we've got one on uh the 25th mm -hmm. and one on the 11th of doing backwards the 11th where jim and i are talking to the board of directors of project apsm great and on the 25th jim and i are going to his b yard to take a look at those packages <laughs> that we put in way way back in in may when we got them and we're going to see how they're doing and and uh since it's live and it's a webinar you'll get to see jim two's b yard oh that'd be now I tuned in to one of those in the springtime, or was it in the fall, and it was raining. So that was seemed like you can never count on the uh, the good weather and good technology happening when. Uh, when yeah, if it's raining, if it's raining, we're going to stand in the garage door and look at his bee yard. <laughs> we're just not going to go out there. Well, it'd be interesting because uh, both packages I put in uh, this year, they both swarmed. So I think I we need to have a podcast one of these days on eight frame equipment and. Um, Maybe hey, I'll, now maybe you're I'll talking learn, my language. Yeah, maybe learning frame. something. frame, all right. Well, speaking of questions, I think uh, that would be a great a great opportunity if uh, any of our listeners have any questions for uh, any of our interviewers, uh, interviewees, <laughs> and uh, or any beekeeping questions in general. Uh, 
write them in and we will get the right people to reply. So our, send your questions to questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. Again, that's what questions. was that address? Yeah, it's <laughs> good question. <laughs> questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. And uh, we'll route them to the right people and get your answer on a future podcast. So um, what do you think about all this, Kim? Well, it was fun talking to Jim today, but then it always is. It's been over three decades since we first met, and not surprisingly, a lot has changed in that time. Notably, I think, the evolution of how each of us approaches our respective jobs. When he first started at Ohio State University Extension, like all rookies, he was on fire, willing to tackle any challenge, climb every mountain, and swim every ocean. So when Mark Bruner, then the editor of Gleanings in Bee Culture, approached him to write on a regular basis, Jim jumped at the chance. He brought a different perspective to the magazine. After all, he was from Alabama, of all places. But his homespun stories, comments, and idealism, along with solid beekeeping information, worked for our readers then and still does today. Not long after he started there, he was appointed extension specialist for the USDA dealing with the newly introduced Africanized honeybee. And overnight, he was almost always on a plane to somewhere talking about what those killer bees might mean to beekeepers and to folks who didn't keep bees but might be impacted because they were here. He taught a commercial beekeeping class, many basic basic beekeeping courses, and a host of other subjects dealing with our craft over the years, along with just being the regular extension agent, answering beekeeping questions to anybody who wanted information. But after only 10 years on the job, Varroa changed the rules of the game and the way he taught beekeepers to keep bees. It has changed all of us, I'm afraid. Probably the biggest change, however, is how he embraced new technology probably more so than most in his position. Early on, he did a series of training videos for Ohio State Extension. Then, he and I did several videos together on raising queens, assembling equipment, and the like. And then he and John Grafton did a series for Ohio State Beekeepers. And now, he's my partner on the Kim and Jim Show webinars we produce. And today, he's done his first podcast. It's been a long but productive road from rural Alabama to a podcast in Ohio. And we're glad he took the journey. And Jeff, that's beekeeping today. Well, that's really good, Kim. That's uh, it's been a fun show. So that wraps it up for today. And I'd like to thank all of our listeners to Beekeeping Today podcast. And uh, wish everyone a, a a good week. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Jeff. Take care. Have a good week. All right, you too. Bye bye.